Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson at Excel International A-Level Chemistry Unit 2 for June 2022. This is the Part 3 video. I'll put the link to the Part 1 and Part 2 below the description box. So let's begin with the first question. Question 17 says this question is about some halogen alkanes. Give the classification of each halogen alkane shown in the table as primary, secondary or tertiary. So from this one here, we can see the carbon where the bromine is attached has only one hydrogen, and that should be a secondary halogen alkane. While here, the bromine is attached to a carbon that has two hydrogens, and that should be a primary halogen alkane. The next day says samples of one iodobutane. One iodobutane has a carbon iodide bond, of course, and we can see it's a primary halogen alkane. And two chloro two methyl propane, this has a carbon chlorine bond and is touch free. So these samples were hydrolyzed using aqueous silver nitrate in ethanol. This explains whether or not it is possible to predict the relative rate of hydrolysis of these two compounds. Now there are contradictory things here. Here this has a carbon iodide bond and this has a carbon chloride bond. This bond is going to be weaker so you'd expect this bond to break faster so that iodide can be uh, attached to silver to produce silver iodide which is a precipitate at a faster rate in comparison to this one here. However, also we know that tertiary halogen alkanes are going to be hydrolyzed faster in comparison to primary halogen alkanes. So, basing on the degree of branching, we would expect the tertiaries to be hydrolyzed faster. And based on the bonding, we would expect this one here to be hydrolyzed faster. So, there is contradictory information. So, here I said 2 chloro 2 methyl propane is a tertiary halogen alkane. And tertiary halogen alkanes are hydrolyzed faster than primary halogen alkanes. Based on these, 2 chloro 2 methyl propane should react the fastest. Also, 1 iodobutane is a primary halogen alkane, and the carbon iodide bond is weaker than the carbon chloride bond, and based on these, 1 iodobutane should react the fastest. So I said, due to the two contradictory factors, it is not possible to predict the relative rates of hydrolysis because the two factors are contradicting, so it's hard to predict this. Moving on. Here they say butyl amine is formed when 1-bromobutane reacts with excess concentrated alcoholic ammonia. So the reaction for that is here. They say give a reason why this reaction should be carried out by heating the reactants in a sealed tube rather than heating under reflux. Now this is a gas, ammonia gas, and if you heat under reflux, since the top of the refluxing condenser is not, is not covered, the ammonia gas is going to escape. So if a sealed tube is not used, the gas would escape from the reaction vessel and the condenser when heated under reflux. So that's it because we do not close or we do not cover the top of the refluxing condenser. The next is they complete the mechanism for this reaction by adding Kali arrows and any relevant lone pairs and dipoles. So this is the mechanism for the reaction they have stated above. It begins by ammonia. Remember, ammonia has a lone pair on nitrogen. That lone pair is going to be donated to this carbon. The reason for that is this carbon is partially positive and this bromide is partially negative since in this bond, bromine is more electronegative than carbon. So that is partial plus, partial minus, and this lone pair is donated there in a dative covalent bond to form this. And then the ammonia again comes, binding onto hydrogen, and then that bond breaks, returning the lone pair, and afterwards we get this product. So those are the steps that were required to be put in the mechanism. Let us continue. The question says bromoethane is prepared by reacting ethanol with potassium bromide and concentrated sulfuric acid. That is the reaction equation. And then they say calculate the maximum mass of bromoethane that could be prepared uh, from 4.65 grams of ethanol, 14.90 grams of potassium bromide, and a solution containing 16.35 grams of sulfuric acid. So they've given us the AR values, those atomic mass values. So I had to use, I calculated the moles of each in order to compare and find out which is the limiting reagent. So moles of ethanol should be mass of ethanol divided by the molar mass of ethanol, which is that. Moles of potassium bromide should be mass of potassium bromide divided by the molar mass of potassium bromide, which gives us that. And the moles of sulfuric acid should be the mass of sulfuric acid divided by the molar mass of sulfuric acid, which gives us that. Now, when we look at the ratio, it should be 1 to 1 to 1, meaning the one with the least moles is going to be the limiting reagent. And when we look, we can see it is ethanol. Ethanol has 0 0.10 while the others have higher than that. So I said ethanol is the limiting reagent. So the moles of the limiting reagents are the ones that are used in the reaction when you're calculating uh, the moles on the other side. 
So here I said, so use the moles of ethanol to calculate the mass of the product. So here the moles are going to be equal, and then the mass of bromoethane is going to be the moles of bromoethane times the molar mass, which is here. You could use your periodic table to calculate that. So that times that gives us that, and uh, which was closer to 11.0 grams. And that is the answer for that. Moving on, they say the reaction between two bromopropane and potassium hydroxide takes place under two different conditions. There is a reaction in aqueous solution and there is a reaction in ethanolic solution. Now, in aqueous condition, this is going to be a substitution reaction, or you could say a nucleophilic substitution reaction, and the product is going to be an alcohol. In ethanolic solution, this is going to be an elimination reaction, and the product is going to be an alkene. So they want us to compare and contrast these two reactions. They want us to include equations for the reaction and detailed mechanisms for these reactions are not required. So I began by talking about things that are similar for both. I said both reactions involve the hydroxide ion from potassium hydroxide. Yes. So in this reaction here, the hydroxide ion in the elimination reaction, the hydroxide ion is going to accept a proton. And in the other one, the hydroxide ion is going to participate in a nucleophilic substitution reaction. So I say the reaction in aqueous solution is a nucleophilic substitution reaction, while that in ethanolic solution is an elimination reaction. In the substitution reaction, OH acts as a nucleophile, while in the elimination reaction, OH acts as a base. Yes, it accepts a proton. Then in the elimination reaction, propene, which is an alkene, is formed, while in the substitution reaction, an alcohol, propan2O, is formed. Now, the equation for the elimination reaction is as below. Uh, you remember we said a hydrogen is going to be accepted, so uh, this one of the hydrogens is going to be removed, like in this case, it's going to be this hydrogen here to form that product and that. So also for the other one, I say the equation for the nucleophilic substitution reaction is going to be that that comes out and the OH comes in to produce an alcohol as well as a bromide on the other side. It brings us to the end of question 17 and the end of section B. So let's continue to question 18. If fuels burn in oxygen to release a lot of energy, many hydrocarbons and alcohols are used as fuels. During complete combustion, they produce carbon dioxide and water. Petrol contains 2, 2, 4, trimethyl pentane, an isomer of octane that promotes smooth combustion. So this is it. They say alcohols such as methanol and ethanol can be used as fuels either on their own or as additives in petrol. So here they say the standard enthalpy change of combustion of that is negative 54761 kilojoules per mole. And they say state the two standard conditions for this enthalpy. Any standard enthalpy change is carried out at a temperature of 298 Kelvin and a pressure of 100 kilopascals. So the next part says write the equation for the complete combustion of that using the molecular formula. So the molecular formula is carbon 8, hydrogen 18. How did I know that? You can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And since it's an alkane, the general formula should be carbon N, hydrogen to N plus 2. So if this is carbon 8, that should be hydrogen 16 plus 2, which is 18. So that that should be the molecular formula. So the molecular formula, I wrote that and then carbon dioxide and water since it's complete combustion. Then when you're kind of balancing this, you begin by balancing the carbons. So since here I have eight carbons, I put an eight here. And then you go to hydrogen. Since here I have 18 hydrogens, I put a nine here to make that 18. Then I balance oxygen last. Since we have nine oxygen atoms plus... 16 oxygen atoms, I'm not saying molecules because 8 times 2 is 16, we create a 25. So we should have 25 atoms, not 25 molecules. So that will create 25 oxygen atoms. You could also write multiples uh, by multiplying these two here to create a 2, a 25, a 16, and an 18. So both equations will be acceptable. Moving on. Here they say draw a labored enthalpy level diagram for the complete combustion of 2, 2, 4 trimethylpentane. So since this is an exothermic reaction, the reactants are going to be higher in energy and the products are going to be lower. So I wrote the equation of the reactants and the higher and the products are a little bit lower. And I put an arrow pointing down to show us how the reaction is going to progress. Then here I put the enthalpy change for this reaction, which is the enthalpy change of combustion, which is negative 5461 kilojoules per mole. I had to label this as enthalpy and here as progress of the reaction. So you get two marks for that. Here they say calculate the heat energy release during the complete combustion of one decimeter cubed of 224 trimethylpentane. 
So since they've given us the density, which is that, and we have the volume on this meter cubed, I can be able to calculate the mass. Mass should be density times volume, which is that we have the density here times the volume. But since this is gram per centimeter cube, I have to convert that to in centimeters cube. And that is by multiplying this by 1000. So it's going to be 1000 times the density that gives me 692 grams. That is the mass. Now, since I have the mass, to calculate the number of moles, it should be mass of a molar mass. I calculated the molar mass here to give me 114, so that divided by 114 gives me 6.070175 mole. Now, to calculate the enthalpy change, it's negative Q over N, since this is an exothermic reaction, and this has to be in kilojoules. So Q in kilojoules is going to be negative delta H times N, which is the negative of the delta H given to me, times the number of moles that I've calculated here. And in the end, I got 33149 kilojoules. So 33149 kilojoules, that is the heat energy release from this reaction. Moving on. Here they say in an experiment to determine the enthalpy change of combustion of ethanol, a student used the apparatus shown. So this is a setup for the combustion. We can see they used a beaker. They did not use a calorimeter, so we expect a lot of heat loss. Then there is an ethanol inside. That is a fuel used. There is a spirit burner. There is a wick. There is a clamp, a thermometer, there is a beaker and water, so that is the setup. Then they told us the mass of water is 100 grams, the mass of ethanol is 0 0.305 grams, and the temperature rise is that. So we are going to use the mass of water as our M in this equation. The specific capacity is given here, so we use it there as our C, and the delta T, which is the temperature change, is going to be used as that. In this question, they want us to calculate the enthalpy change of combustion of ethanol, and they want you to give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures and include the sign as well as the units. So here I said Q is equal to mc delta T. The mass is 100 times the specific capacity times the delta T. And I got 5517.6 joules. Remember, it comes out as joules, but you divide by 1000 to convert it to kilojoules since Q should be in kilojoules. On the other side, I found the number of moles of the fuel, which is ethanol, so it should be the mass of ethanol, which is that, divided by 46, which is the molar mass of ethanol, and I got the number of moles. Now, to find delta H, delta H is equal to negative Q over N, which is negative that, divided by number of moles, which is that, and I got negative 832 kilojoules per mole as my answer to three significant figures. Continuing on, they say the uncertainty in each thermometer reading is plus or minus 0 0.05. So they say calculate the percentage uncertainty in temperature rise in this experiment. So I say the thermometer was read twice. So we said 2 times the uncertainty, which is plus or minus 0 0.05, divided by the value which is measured in this case is delta T times 100. And my answer here, if you want to put plus or minus, so my answer is plus or minus 0 0.7576. That is the percentage and satinity. Moving on, they say the student looked in a data book and found the actual value for the standard enthalpy change of combustion of ethanol, which was more exothermic than the experimental value obtained. This means the heat transferred to the water in this experiment was lower than thought. They say give two reasons between the difference between the data book value and the experimental value, other than referring to standard conditions. So it's easy, mainly heat loss to the surrounding, or it means maybe the ethanol evaporated, or it means there is incomplete combustion. If the ethanol evaporated, then it means the mass of ethanol is going to be thought to be higher than it actually was. And then incomplete combustion, that is if there is not enough oxygen to fully burn all the fuel released from the spirit burner. So some of it is lost and not burnt. So let's continue. Here they say the enthalpy change for the conversion of four compounds in the gas phase into their constituent atoms as shown below. They've given us all these and they said calculate the bond enthalpy of the carbon carbon bond in kilojoules per mole and you must show your working. Now I began with the one for water. We know in water we have two hydrogen oxygen bonds as you can see here. So since they gave us that the enthalpy for this reaction is 9 to 8 and yet two bonds were broken. So I said that divided by 2 gives us that for each oxygen hydrogen bond. So now we know the enthalpy change for each oxygen hydrogen bond. Then down here for methane, we know for methane we have four carbon hydrogen bonds and they gave us plus 1740. So for this one here, I said that divide by four. The enthalpy given for the whole thing divided by four gives me plus 435 kilojoules per mole. Now I have the oxygen hydrogen as well as the carbon hydrogen. 
Uh, when I went to methanol, methanol is like this. It has three carbon hydrogen bonds. It has one carbon oxygen and one oxygen hydrogen. So they are here in total. So my calculation is here three times. Remember, I already have the carbon hydrogen as that. I do not have the carbon oxygen, but I have the oxygen hydrogen as that. So I'm going to look for that by equating all these to that, which is for the whole methanol, which gives me uh, carbon oxygen is plus 336 kilojoules per mole. Since I have that, I went to ethanol. In ethanol, we have one, two, three, four, five carbon hydrogen bonds. We have one carbon carbon bond. We have one carbon oxygen bond and we have one oxygen hydrogen as listed here. So since I have this already, I have that already, and I have this already from previous calculations, I just substituted. So 5 times 435 plus 336, which is for that, plus the carbon-carbon single bond, which I'm looking for, plus that, which is that, and equated to the enthalpy for the whole thing, which is that. And then when I made this the subject, I got plus 347 kilojoules per mole. This is what I was looking for. So I say, therefore, the bond energy for the carbon-carbon is plus 347 kilojoules per mole. That is the answer. Lastly here, they say ethanol can be manufactured by reacting ethene with steam. The equation for this reaction is here, and we can see it's an exothermic reaction. They say this reaction is usually carried out in industry at 300 degrees and 70 atmosphere pressure using a catalyst. This explains the effect on equilibrium position and the equilibrium yield of ethanol if the reaction is carried out at 300 degrees Celsius in 200 atmospheres. If you look at the new conditions, the temperature remained the same, but the pressure has gone more than twice. So it's 200. So it means the pressure was increased. If you want to know the effect of carrying out a reaction at higher pressure, look at the number of molecules on the product side and the reactant side. Here we see the product side has fewer molecules, and that means increasing pressure is going to shift equilibrium to the product side, leading to a higher yield of ethanol. So here I say, since there are fewer molecules of gas on the right-hand side, when pressure is increased, meaning from 70 to 200 atmospheres, the equilibrium position will shift to the right, and this will lead to an increase in the yield of ethanol. So this brings us to the end of this paper. Thank you for being with us. Please do not forget to subscribe to our channel. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.